were the two teachers. Where school is always in session. Andy, today we're looking at civil rights. We've spent a couple of lessons looking at civil liberties. Those are my individual rights. Now we're looking at civil rights, which deals a little bit more with our group rights, how we're treated as women, how we're treated as African Americans, how we're treated in the LGBTQ community. Andy, could there be anything more important than equality? Well, when we talk about civil rights, you're very right that we are defining civil rights as the protection of groups against discrimination, against discrimination by government, against discrimination by employers, against discrimination by uh, private entities. Civil liberties is protecting our, our protections against abuse of government, but civil rights is protecting groups of people. It could be age, religion, gender. You're absolutely right. And Andy, critical part of the expansion of civil rights, which has always been an issue in our nation's history, was the passage of the 14th Amendment. We've talked about that before with civil liberties and the due process clause, but in terms of civil rights, we're really focused on the equal protection clause that says that groups have to be treated equally. Andy, that 14th Amendment, as I think more and more about it, sounds like a second constitutional convention. It was a game changer. It dramatically changed the role and relationship of the national government with states. We saw how the wow. Due Process Clause affected civil liberties, and now how the Equal Protection Clause has empowered the national government to come into the states and say, you can't discriminate like that anymore. Well, we can look back on it and say it was dramatic, but we all know that this took a lot of time and decades for the courts to actually read the 14th Amendment and interpret it the way that it's interpreted today in modern times, because we had a 14th Amendment that guaranteed equal protection, and yet the Supreme Court still allowed cases like Plessy versus Ferguson, which has set the precedent that you could have separate, separate facilities that were still considered equal. And of course, we know that that precedent was overturned in a key landmark case, Brown versus the Board of Education, that said you could not have separate but equal public educational facilities. But Andy, where this story gets really exciting for me and for you as civics teachers is that this evolution of how we looked at the Equal Protection Clause wasn't initiated by government, it was initiated by just ordinary regular citizens like you and I, social movements who join together, like Martin Luther King and the great civil rights movement of the 1950s. I mean, will we ever forget the power of that language in the letter home from a Birmingham jail where Martin Luther King pens while sitting in a jail cell a, 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 a creed, a manifesto that inspired a revolution? And it really is a critical example of how a grassroots movement where King and his, his supporters are trying to get alliances across the country to build support for the desegregation efforts and how that grassroots effort at the individual level turns into this social movement where you see the courts become part of the effort and you see politicians, you see legislation at the national level and local level, national examples of legislation like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which is where Congress used its Commerce Clause powers to tell uh, commercial enterprises that they could not discriminate based on race. Andy, I can't get out of my head those words of King when he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And Andy, in this crisis we're currently living in, Boy, I think there'll be some movements that will start and they'll begin reflecting on certain injustices that are taking place even as we speak. And we might see a, a, just a renaissance of civil rights in the midst of this crisis. Well, you're absolutely right when you talk about the economics of the crisis, the politics, uh, the policies, the healthcare policy. And when we compare, uh, when, you know, when this is all over and it will be all over, uh, when we compare how different states, how different localities address this crisis and what states and localities were successful or maybe more successful than others, 
you're definitely going to get questions about equality. Well, and the civil rights movement wasn't just about African-Americans, Andy. Remember the women's movement and now the National Organization of Women, but even in reproductive rights and, and uh, the pro-choice and the pro-life movements. Andy, because of the Equal Protection Clause, we have been invited to participate in a policy debate over equality. It's really a great story and a story that's not over. No. How about Title IX? Let's not forget about that, Andy. Oh, well, when you get in, right when you get into Title IX, you're talking about gender rights, particularly in public education. And a lot of our students know that Title IX applies to public sports and, and college athletics and equal opportunities for athletics. But Title IX is also a crucial legislation in telling public schools that they can't have. Uh, gender discrimination when it comes to class choices. You can't tell female students that they have to take home ec and tell, and tell male students that they have to take woodshop. Well, the civil rights movement is an ongoing story, and it's really a story where we're balancing minority rights with majority rights. And this is a fundamental debate in our government. And it's fundamental because Thomas Jefferson promised us in the Declaration of Independence that we are in fact all created equal. A debate we need to continue in a debate we will here because we're the two teachers. No fancy words. No fancy suits. Plain talk about issues you need to know. Just in time.